This is Startup Storefront. One in three restaurants won't survive their first year. Profit margins are razor thin, staff turnover is high, and there's a lot of competition. As David Kuo, our guest today and self-titled Head Fatty will explain, discovering product market fit is a painful process of personal sacrifice. His first restaurant specialized in California-inspired cuisine, and as much as he wanted it to work, it just didn't get the support he wanted. So he doubled down, put it all on the line, and reopened the restaurant as Little Fatty, a Taiwanese soul food restaurant. New cuisine, new name, and new processes. The restaurant exploded in popularity. They're number one on Uber Eats for the LA area, and if you don't make a reservation beforehand, good luck getting in. But now, David is taking this concept to the next level by opening Fatty Mart and Junto's Market. There were food, culture, and community intersect to provide convenience without compromise. In this episode, we discuss with David what it was like working for a Michelin star restaurant in New York City, why he slept above the walk-in fridge at his restaurant, and how he is partnering with local growers to make the best food possible. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to <laughs> Chief Fatty, David Kuo. Thanks for coming on. For people yeah. who don't know, what do you do? What's your gym? Yeah, so uh, my wife and I own Little Fatty Accomplice Bar, we're about to open Fatty Mart and uh, a project with you. That's in right. Downtown and another project right next to all our other restaurants. What got you into the, the culinary food space? What was the thing? Were you always interested yeah, as a so, kid or what was the, you were just hungry? You were a big fatty? Growing up, uh, food like any other family. Uh, was Where did the, you grow up? I grew up in West Covina. My parents okay. are from Taiwan, spe- uh, specifically uh, Taizong. And uh, they came here in 1967, and so I was born in 1978. What brought um, them? What brought them here? Um, luckily, you know, it was kind of a complicated story. But like in the 60s, 70s, they struck down like the Chinese Exclusion Whatever Act, and they allowed Asian people to come in. So there was a big influx in the 60s and 70s of uh, immigrants coming in. My dad got in for chemical engineering at UCLA, and so he came first. And then two years later, my mom and brother came. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Hence the I Love Taiwan hat here. <laughs> For people wondering, the I Love Taiwan hat yeah. on the YouTube channel, you can see it. Yeah. Okay. And then at what point do you start finding like an interest or, or yeah, so, so your dad's up, an engineer, right? And so I don't, okay. So what happened? So growing up, uh, food was always the focal point, uh, weddings, birthdays, holidays, okay. um, that kind of thing. I had three older brothers, so it was four siblings. Uh, You're the parents. youngest of four? I'm the youngest of four. You're the baby? I'm the baby. So um, my wow. grandma, my mom would, you know, be cooking traditional stuff we grew I mean it was embarrassing growing up but they grew like garlic chives and like you know yam leaves and people would come over and be like what, what are these things that smell like the basketball would roll into the garlic chives and you'd be like embarrassed uh, but now looking back I was actually really lucky growing up with like a little farm in the back and yeah it's amazing um, my to- uh, my mom would uh, tell me to go cut some green onions and stuff like that so that was pretty lucky so food was always pretty integral with three older brothers my oldest brother was like 12 years older so you would have to eat fast so you always got left out. Yeah. So then, you know, yeah, I started learning yourself. to eat fast and that's how I became bigger. And they called me, <laughs> they called me Xiao Pang, which means. Uh, when you say bigger, fatty. you mean. Like uh, taller and fatter. Yes. Taller and yeah. fatter. Yeah. Wow. So Xiao Pang means little fatty. Yeah. Okay. Xiao Pang. That was my nickname growing up. And so it kind of carried over and we thought it'd be a good name for the restaurant. But wait, wait, wait. So what, what about your culinary? So at some oh, yeah, point. So we skipped the whole chapter yeah. there. Um, so I went to UCLA like my father. Uh, two of my brothers went to UCLA. So three of us. I heard they have a the great four. culinary program. No, <laughs> they do actually have some good dorm food back in the day, but I don't know about now. Yeah. So even in college. What did you study? I studied economics and bar- barely got not kicked out. I went to school. Maybe. Oh, I shouldn't say this. I went to school maybe a hundred times. And still graduated, like physically. I don't know. Don't watch UCLA. You can't turn it back, right? Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a first. <laughs> so I switched majors to political science. Um, In the middle at yeah. some point. And okay. so even at the dorms, we would like make our own concoctions out of like a salad bar or burger bar, whatever it is. Okay. But one of the most memorable things is once we moved out of the dorms, we used to have, uh, you know, barbecues. I guess our house was like the house that everyone congregated at because it was like a four bedroom. Your college a, house? Yeah. Okay. Patio. Okay. Um, I mean, we rented it. We used to have like... Iron Chef was the uh, big deal back then. So yeah. we'd have Iron Chef competitions and stuff like that. So food's always been part of it. We always like, really? drove to SGV or, you know, uh, where the good food was, you know, where we heard good food was. So you never were in culinary school, though. This was just no, like no. a, this is like a hobby. So after up, college, up I did some property management in one of the properties, had a restaurant. And so I started dabbling after work and then finally got serious, went to cooking school. Like, and were your parents on you at all about 
Um, the, after pursuing. three older siblings, um, both you know, three older sons, yeah. they kind of just like, oh, uh, let him do whatever I hope, he wants. I hope he turns out all right. Okay, <laughs> that's yeah. fair. So you weren't getting pressure, the typical, let's call it Asian parent. Yeah, pressure. yeah. I mean, of course, there's pressure to be a doctor, a lawyer, but I knew I could never work in office. So went to cooking school, worked at you know some restaurants out here, but then got serious after cooking school. I worked at a three Michelin star place in New York, and it's uh, called John George. It was at the Trump Tower, still there. What kind of food was it? It's like, uh, so he's pretty famous. Uh, he has like 50 restaurants around the world, a couple of Michelin stars. But he's famous because his, his mentor sent him to Thailand in like the 70s. So it was like him cooking French food, but using Thai ingredients. So he was like the OG fusion guy. Okay. But it wasn't really fusion. Um, if you eat his food, you'll taste the complexity of like, you know, replacing butter with other flavorful things. Yeah. For people that don't know, what is it actually like work, working under... A, a person that you were working, like a Michelin star, famous, let's call it, or well-known, yeah. or a savant? Yeah, so I worked in maybe two or three Michelin star restaurants. Um, it's always uh, a lot of pressure, but that's why I went to New York. Uh, some people say, you know, it's like really hard or whatever, but if you really want to yeah. see what the best is, or, you know, what, what it's like to have three Michelin stars, and then you go work for one and just see what it takes. Okay. Obviously, well, after Noma, you know it's not a, a right system, but like yeah. to be part of something that can attain those three stars is pretty amazing. What was like a day in the life? Uh, when I first started, it was a real wake up lesson that I thought I could cook, but you couldn't. But by the end, I could work every station on a Friday and help everybody at the same time. That's what the goal of a good line cook is. Okay. And it took me about you know three to six months to figure that to out. To figure that out. Yeah, I think after the first or second month, I got tired of yelling at, so I said, I started uh, even on my off time. As soon as I walked out the door, I, I started writing down all the things I can do to get faster, better how to get ahead because you always didn't have enough time. Did everybody do that or was that just something uh, you did? I didn't worry about everybody else. Wow. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't want to get yelled at. <laughs> I always wonder, I, you know, obviously from, I've never been in a kitchen of, yeah. of that caliber, but at least like when you're watching some movies, sometimes it's like everyone has a notebook of some kind and it's either used for ingredients or different things that they can improve upon. Um, but I always wonder, is that is that unique to the, that individual or is that unique to the culture? Yeah, I didn't really ask other people how they did it. I just had a book and usually it's like recipes in the front, uh, wow. things that you needed, like prep list in the middle and like other things way in the back, like, you know, things that you learned or whatever. Like okay. glossary. And so you learned you really couldn't cook at all. Yeah. That's at fascinating. That point. But through him, actually, he was probably the most influential chef. The person that I went to New York with, they were working at Per Se. And if you look at the food versus uh, the two different styles, like one's traditional French, one's French Thai, and then there was like less use of butter, cream, I think that's just like cheating. And so I got introduced to all like these great ingredients that were Asian uh, back then before the internet uh, could really help you. Okay. And so we actually got hands on like real uh, star anise, like green star anise, like real fresh anise. butter. Yeah. yeah. Fresh chestnuts and like crazy finger chilies and all that stuff. And then at some point, you're done with your time with this chef. And then do you decide to leave? Like, yeah. what, what so is I was, leaving I was going like? to stay, but my dad um, got cancer. And so I had to come back and take care of him. Okay, it was so pretty much back to terminal California. cancer. So it was like the last, he was like, you need to come home because I'm going to die like, in, you know, within Jesus. a year. Okay. And so all my other brothers had legitimate jobs. So I was tasked with the to honor take care of, him. of taking care of him until the end. Yeah. Wow. So that was a little Did heavy. you cook for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess... What he could, could, what he could eat. Yeah. Wow. So that's what brought you back here. Yes. And then what happened? After that, did some property. I mean, you know, did some property management. Always helped other people in their kitchens. I mean, this is a long time ago. Like uh, when Kraft opened, we you know helped out there. Or when Nancy Silverton opened a burger shop, helped there. Helped okay. out, open Bestia and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, just I, volunteering, not like sure. managing. And then yeah. at some point, you go, okay, I I, I have the chops or. No, I think always, like, or... I knew I wasn't going to be a line cook. I just wanted to open a restaurant. Okay. And I thought I could do it. And, boy, was I in for a lesson. So t- <laughs> what was the thing that you did first? First? Uh, was it convincing your wife? Again, yeah. Was, well, convincing <laughs> my, luckily, my wife had a stable tech job. Okay. And uh, I had a little money saved up. We flipped a house in uh, the Bay Area. I never, because my friend had a whole system and my, like, best friend from college so like we went up there once didn't even see the house we just knew the areas he showed us the areas and we had to pull the trigger real fast okay so made made some money and used that yeah. to find a place and so then you decide to start is this the one in mar vista that's the first place no actually school of hard knocks is like we signed a lease like in 20 2010 
Twenty okay. that's very far long. Because uh, I remember because and they didn't start construction until like December twenty twelve. Oh, and so a, a you name. know I spent money on that thing and then you know by the end it was just like taking too long so I just walked away. You and, walked away. Yeah, it was a big learning so, lesson. So did you lose all your money basically? No, no, a big chunk. Okay. So we had a little bit left, and my wife, luckily, was patient. She's all like, you know, this is your dream. You better go chase it or whatever. That is and a patient so, like, wife. A, a year later, we signed a lease for the Mar Vista space. And you had it, no kids at this time, right? No. No. And no then kids. it took uh, another year to build it because I didn't know what I was doing. It was only like a thousand feet or existing kitchen. As you get closer to, let's call it like a opening day, what are some of the things that you remember that you wish you kind of, like you reflect on it today and you're like, wow, if I, if I had known, you know, like one or two things about opening. It was not. It was clearly not the right concept, and I was living a fantasy. And uh, it was never going to be successful. It was like 16, 18 seats, a rotisserie shop with some California cuisine. Okay, <laughs> a little so confusing. The, yeah. So it wasn't high volume enough. It wasn't fancy enough. And I'll never have the staff or the firepower of you know the people that are doing the same thing. I think the hardest part about the restaurant business is probably the staffing and the people. I would yeah. imagine. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was the the very beginning. Okay. I guess. Yeah. And so opening day happens. What's it like? Oh, it's crazy. The GM, who was a seasoned veteran from New York, and he, you know, ran some high-profile places in New York, you could you could tell when people get nervous. Uh, they turn like the deer in headlights. They get uh, pale, and so he right like 15 minutes. Like you know, I was, I kept saying, "Are you right? You know, we got this. There's only 16 seats," and then uh, he up and left like right before we opened. <laughs> so like we didn't he went even home? have a manager. Yeah. So we had like Why? one waiter, me, one cook, dishwasher, Why did and that he leave? was it. Because he got scared. Oh my God. It was 16 seats. And he got scared of 16 seats? Yeah, he got scared. All right. So then you, you have this opening. It went well. And then what did you realize you were missing and you had, you had to grow and to do other things? No, I mean, we just kept making it work. It actually got better and better. And like we did brunch, better as in like from zero to like $1,000 is better. Yeah. We got better and better. But the idea was always to expand and get a, a bar. So luckily, you know, I built relations with the landlord. He's, they're really nice. They're actually the landlord of all our, you know, the, the market that we're opening and then the next um, concept we're opening next to the market. So they gave us um, the right to do it. So as soon as I opened, I started the CUP process. But you know how long that takes back then. So that was like, you know, year, year to get it, year to build it, whatever. Yeah. So that's, so two years later, you know, we were doing this thing. It was okay. It was like not losing money, not making money. And then, um, but I was spending money to, for the construction. Yeah. So, you know how that goes. Then once it opened, my wife had our second child the day after. And so, so then we had to hire a chef and like, you know, we did the new California thing, double down because we got cocktails and you think, oh my God, I own a bar. I'm going to be so rich, but you actually lose more money if you don't know what you're doing. And so like, <laughs> so yeah, if you don't manage it right, um, yeah, yeah, you learn, you, you live and learn. So after three months, you know, you know, I was at home and taking care of, you know, my wife and my family, she said that I can go back to work. And so we decided to pivot and just try the runway was closing. And so we thought, well, if it's going to close, let's just cook the food that we always wanted to, which is like, you know, Taiwanese Chinese food. Oh, wow. So you did like a, a hard pivot. I was like, this is it, man. I got six months. And, wow. you know, because you got to spend money to pivot. Right. We got new equipment. We got to walk and, you know, new PR. Yeah. New dishes. A lot of stuff. New, new name? Website. Same name. Yeah, new name. Okay. So all that, we had to pivot. Okay. And luckily since then, every month has been going so up So it was like up. well received. Yeah, ever, ever since then. It was the right move. Yeah. And so that was my, my school of hard knocks over oh the next two God. years too. I think I finally graduated the school of hard knocks and I'll get you there in, so in, in think, the next half hour, guys. I think <laughs> the way I interpret this is like an, as an entrepreneur, you, you struggled for a long time, effectively finding like your product market fit, let's call it. And it's interesting that once people see the end, like once they know, oh my God, I have a year left, six months left, three months left, it forces the brain. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm always thinking, um, I don't know what right. about other people, you had the other signals restaurant. There. Yeah. It's like, I have an endless mind that just keeps thinking how to get better. Uh, I think there's a Japanese term called Kaizen for it or something. Kaizen. Like yeah. And yeah. constantly improving is what that yeah. means. Yeah. So I realized that my ego got in the way. Like I worked at these three mission stars. I'm going to charge $30 for this and I'm not going to sell this. Like I'm not going to give you ketchup or whatever. But then you realize that didn't make us money and it, and it's very mm. painful. So mm. why not give them the orange chicken? Okay. But so then just, you can do chefy stuff. Like we spend a lot of time on our dandan, right? Our dandan has like 57 ingredients. We make our own pasta. 
uh, at a some like a Western mm-hmm. style pasta, mof, mm-hmm. mofadine. So we pick and choose, you know, what's going to set us apart and give the people what they also want. They want dumplings. They want fried rice. Okay. Reduce the friction. Yeah. Interesting. From an entrepreneurial perspective, like give give people a sense of how long you're working. Like, what are the days like? Maybe at the beginning. Like, in the very beginning, it was very terrible. I used to sleep above the walk-in. Uh, like one time, I forgot I had a thousand sandwiches to make before six a.m. And so, you know, at twelve, I had to go grab someone who was already drinking and like, help <laughs> me make sandwiches. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was really painful. Like in the beginning, but now we have a staff of like sixty. That's going to be like hundred and fifty. Yeah. Uh, in like two months. Yeah. Let's talk about your fatty mart. And so, what what was the sort of the the signals from the market that this concept could work and so you know because of the humble success of little fatty i always looked restaurant cocktail yeah, yeah. bar i mean what's the next thing how do i make revenue outside the walls or what's the next how to keep keep it going mm-hmm. and uh, how to stay ahead of like trends and you know what's the next step obviously restaurants are very burdensome i love cooking food originally we wanted to we looked into cpgs uh, we talked to some, you know, co-packers and like, you know, distributors and like, it just seems so daunting, the minimums, the shelf life, the startup cost. Mm-hmm. And so I said, you know what, maybe a better idea is just to make like an Asian 7-Eleven, but my way. So that's where Fatty Mart came by. Okay. Uh, I think after having kids and, and, you know, seeing how hard it is to run a restaurant, I didn't want to open more restaurants, not yet, mm-hmm. but I thought this avenue of prepared foods, super authentic, easily available, like the 10 to 20 range, that you can go in, pick up stuff for your family, for your kids, and for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where Fatty Mark came out of, yeah. And when's it opening? Uh, it should open in March, but don't hold me to it. Yeah, it's actually legally, o- legally. Uh, You're able uh, to yeah, open Yeah, we're today. able to open, but right now we're just practicing, hiring, teaching, and getting everything right because it's taking so long and it's like our baby. Yeah. So we want to get everything right before we open. Not to promise everything's going to be right, but yeah. as much as we can. You do a million things in a day, I've learned. And so when it comes to giving people a window into like the things you're, you're working on, whether it's food prep, whether it's building these relationships with different people that you can partner with, what is a day in the life like? Yeah, so it's, it's crazy. You have to wear so many hats and people say that, but like you can't just wear the hat. You have to be good at that hat. Otherwise, you'll be buying multiple hats you might as well just bought the Louis Vuitton hat and level up. So like yesterday, we finally nailed down after like the eighth person, our branding. So that's really, really exciting. Like we didn't settle, like these weren't good or, I mean, not, not, the, not to say they weren't good, but it just wasn't representative of us. Yeah. And so we finally found a person that really, really gets it. And, you know, I think that's what's happening now is like all my experience of failing, uh, networking, like I used to like go meet brokers or random people and I'm always down to meet someone once, but like if you don't get it, then I'm not going to be, you know, meeting yeah. you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you're going to reach out, great. I'll mentor you or whatever. You know, like I, I, I kind of allow a lot some time during the week to help other people out, up and coming people, because it also helps me keep sharp and, you know, give back. So you started yeah. the commissary. You're yeah, at this, so then, you're there. You know, you got the, like we, you got, we you got have, a whiskey you're working on that yeah, we have in front of us Externally, we have so many people helping us and like you got to manage that and like, you know, it changes, you know, new social media or whatever, new branding, different purveyors, onboarding new people, how to train them. It's not even built yet. You got to train them. We're going through a lot right now. Yeah. I think nationally, California has some of the highest labor rates as it, as it relates to minimum wage is a lot higher. They're trying to get, they're trying to get it even higher to be more of a livable wage, they call it. And I think COVID proved this too, but I mean, it just feels like they're making it impossible for restaurants to exist. And there, <laughs> need, there needs to be like a reframing, right? And so it forces you to get sharper, but that's just like a bell curve, like most people won't. And then it forces the discussion around like, what would you do different? Or you, you see what I'm saying? Like, as you think about just improving your business and growing your, let's call it empire, what are the things that you view as real problems going against you? I mean, how long is this show? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's great that you bring this up because, you know, uh, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things, not just like laws, but it's actually people. How do I take care of the workers that, you know, it's not easy working in the kitchen. You know, you get burned. It's long hours. You don't get to spend time. You don't get to watch Super Bowls. You don't go get to spend Christmas with your family. How do I reward them, pay them as much, build a system where it's benefiting employees, the earth, the community, the investor, the customer, and the founder. So we kind of came up with a system in my own mind. So, you know, we're opening Fatty Mart. Um, that's going to open in March. But, you know, the project in the future is Juntos. 
Juntos is going to be employee-owned, uh, philanthropic, the next iteration uh, version of Fatty Mart, but more Latin focused for, for, for my employees. And so that's your way of addressing... That's, that's the way to ensure that I'm taking care of my people uh, that work so hard for me, but also ensures that we can keep opening things because everyone gets a share of that. You know, there's like, it's like 50-50. Like yeah. Okay. And so, you know, employees uh, get generational wealth and we get to open more things and uh, do more fun things. I think what's missing is like, I'm not all about the money. It's about uh, changing the way people eat, doing it with the people that you like to be, love to be around and changing the way people interact with food and sharing culture and community, I think. Um, that's a dark time in America and in LA. If I can open a market and people come and learn about you know, different cuisines and different cultures and why certain things, I can move the needle a little bit through food. When it comes to this model, have you seen it d done before? Is there anybody else doing this employee only or this employee yeah. only? So the funny thing is, uh, I was on my um, equipment um, purveyor, and he was crying that you know this market's taking too long, that we're paying storage fees, and that we're losing money. And I said, like he he's losing money. Yeah. So I okay. said, wow. what do you care? You don't own the company. He goes, oh wait, no, we uh, we're an um, employee owned company. It's an ESOP. So mm. we you know we all have shares in this. So I am losing money. So that got me thinking. That's an interesting point of view. So, so it's always great to talk to people. I always try to talk to people and yeah. like learn new things. And that got my mind going. You know, I have some mentors out there that, you know, I talk to, you know, maybe it's you, maybe it's my other friend that give us advice. And, you know, it makes me think, you know, we're trying to build something that's sustainable, like different, and that's never been done before. That's actually makes sense. I always try to think what, what happened to common sense? Like, you know, take care of your employees. They'll take care of you. Okay, let's do it. So how do you do that? So I give them, you know, this whole revenue stream or this whole concept, yeah. right? So Juntos is going to be the first one. Yes. People don't know, David and I are collaborating on a project <laughs> as uh, we're, we're purchasing a building in the Chinatown area. And we're in the design process of making this thing a pretty epic market slash restaurant, outdoor area, greenhouse, cool vibe. It's going to be a lot of fun. So someone just uh, came up with a new term. I think it's called grocerant or something like that. Grocerant. But I don't want to use it. <laughs> okay. So that's like in Italy. In Italy, yeah. like a grocery aunt? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Do you feel nervous about this concept? No, I'm actually really, really excited. You know, we talked about it all the time. There's so many, I mean, I don't want to give everything, are we supposed to give everything away? No, never. <laughs> never. So, I mean, in, in 20 months or whatever, 12 yeah. months, yeah. I hope to bring it to, to market. Yeah. And, you know, it's in Chinatown, Lincoln Heights. We're going to provide services. We're going to give back to the community. Um, there's going to be education. It's going to be a place where you can hang out, bring your dog, drink a coffee, eat a croissant, get some awesome grilled meats and tacos and seafood. I can't wait. What are prepared foods are you working on? For Fatty Mart? Or, well, yeah. Fatty Mart will be inside Juntos, too. We're working on, you know, you know our Korean line is called K-Fatty. We have Fatty Drip, which is... Uh, which is coffee, our own roasted coffee. Fatty drip. Um, I thought you were going to say it's like gold chains. <laughs> so we have a fatty slice. Not everything's fatty. There's ama, which means like uh, grandma in uh, Taiwanese. And so it's like simple, homey, you know, Asian stir-fried things to eat with your main dish. Uh, we're going to have a carniceria aspect with Korean, American, and Latin. Try to get all the, the best accoutrements, side dishes, panchan, salsas. The tortillas are from the last two years of uh, KCRW Tortilla Championship. La Prezzacita and Mejorado. We're trying to curate things, but I don't like that word. But also, it's a lot of us making things. We do a lot of research. We put a lot of love and this is what I love about it is like I'm learning to le cook these other cuisines and why they cook these things and how and trying to paint homage and try to bring it to light um, on the west side because I think there's it's missing on that side of town. When you think about the hat that you wear, do you feel like it's a political statement in any capacity given today's uh, situation? Yeah, I mean, it I feels think like they, China will invade any day now. Yeah, so someone said Taiwan's the most dangerous place in the world. It is because basically, you know, for all the political reasons, but also they make all the chips. Microchips. Yeah, microchips. Yeah, computer And so it's a little, chips. it's going to be a fight uh, over it. You know, I was going to do a Taiwanese documentary series and, and that got me thinking and talking to people and like, what is Taiwan, ta what is Taiwan, what is Taiwanese people known for and, you know, what's the culture and it's kind of crazy is like we ride this line where even when you compliment something, you don't compliment it because we're so used to like living on this fine line of not being out there too much to get attention from China. Um, but you still have to like learn to live your life. 
and find a balance. And like, I mean, we're the best chip maker, but you can't go around saying that because we're, we're the best Chinese chip maker, I guess. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's kind of like weird if you say the old generation, I guess, I don't know, I don't know about now is like, oh, what's the traits? We work hard. We don't, you know, talk about bragging about stuff. And like, you know, we love food and family and doing work. Are you worried? Worried for Taiwan? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after Ukraine, I think everyone's worried about the whole world. I mean, not just Taiwan. Yeah. There's, you know, everywhere you look, it's crazy. Yeah. Gasoline, uh, global warming, no water, earthquakes. Who's leading us? I mean, come on. There's so much. I wanted to, to touch on this. So, so during COVID, obviously, there's so many restaurants closed down. But you guys were like a shining example. And, and I think you attribute that to probably the to-go, the, the Uber Eats that really took off for you guys. Can you just touch on that? Yeah. So I think what I learned through the School of Hard Knocks of, of restaurants is you can't just be what you were in the past. It's like every day you're improving. Every day you're seeing what's going on because people's tastes change or like maybe you mispriced something or maybe you missed the mark on something. And so immediately when I heard, I, I was supposed to go to Asia, so I, I kind of knew what was going on. Uh, actually got really sick. I think I had COVID early, patient early. Zero. like I gave it, I gave it to all of Spain cause I went to Barcelona for you, San Sebastian, but I, I literally for eight days was walking around with Robitussin in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and so I knew something was coming and I knew it wasn't going to be short. They're like two weeks. I'm like, nah, man, they're okay. not going to figure this out. So immediately it happened. Um, we closed for like a week or a day and that was really scary cause your, your bills keep coming, but your income doesn't keep coming. Yeah. And so luckily we got back open. I knew we had to pivot because we were on a ticket system. And so like every station had tickets, the old school way, like in the bear, his nightmare is like that, that D, great D, show. D, D, D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So everyone yeah. had one of those. Yeah. So then we invested money in technology and figured out a way to streamline and, you know, automate ordering. So we taught our customer, you can't walk up, you can't call and you have to use our online platform, whether it be ours or Uber. Okay. Only because how long would it take you to take an on, uh, a right. phone order? Right, right. And then how long, like everyone has a tablet, so all Two these tablets are beeping, yeah. which one do I do first? And then like, what if I mess up? Right. Right, so the human error part was Is uh, real. Yeah, real. Yeah. But now every station has a computer, they know what to make, and then like it's triple checked from like two chefs a ba and two baggers um, before your food goes out. Okay. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, so right now we're like number one on Uber. On number one on Uber Eats in LA. Uh, Uber Eats Postmates. And Postmates. Uh, yeah, well, they're a team. Yeah. Um, so we have a partnership with them. Like I just texted them today. Like, what are we doing? We're rolling out like um, a whole plan. I mean, what are we doing? Because my sales were down. So then I'm like, what promotion should we do? You know, the algorithm. Uh, we always take into account how to throttle like Chinese New Year. We set up a whole system because uh, oh, on right. Christmas, on Christmas, we got destroyed. That's Sorry about day. that, guys. Yeah. Uh, but we figured it out, like putting ticket times, like only so many tickets per 15 minutes and stuff like that and streamlining things. Uh, but, you know, we do 1,500 items on a Friday. And so that's in five hours. So that's like five or six fulfilling. It could be a drink. It could be rice, but it could be compound chicken. Yeah. So it's crazy if you just think about it, five items, or five items per minute we fulfill. Do you ever have a desire to go back into fine dining? No, actually, it's kind of funny that it's all coming to light now. But ever since I've had kids, anytime me, my wife or friends or friends get together, it's always ethnic food. So it's like stuff you can't cook at home, stuff that you can't get, what's authentic. And so we go seek it out. So it's usually Koreatown or, you know, yeah. SGV or OC or, you know. That's interesting. Little India. For me, that's like any, anything I can't cook to save my life. <laughs> anything else you want to rant about? Oh, yeah. So we have a, <laughs> um, a farm. <laughs> Where's Little your farm? City, uh, it's called Little, Little City, City farm. Farms, LA. It's in uh, Midtown. So it's a test program. Um, like we said, you know, we're getting an ESG made for us or compiled a report for us. So it makes sure that everything we do falls in line of uh, our goals, which is always, you know, people, planet, and, you know, um, food. And so we came up with this idea during the pandemic. Uh, I have a farmer friend. Um, so it was a test case of like, let's plant an urban farm. This is like 15,000 feet in mid city. It's a whole lot. It's um, really cool. We went there. Half event space, There's half bees. event space, half farm. But it's a event space is awesome because we can start talking. This is the pilot. And we have two more spaces lined up. I ordered two Rivians, five canoes. If they ever get here, we'll be using them. But canoes, the idea, what's a canoe? Um, it's an awesome modern day delivery truck that's electric, oh, a little cool. lightweight. That's, you know, more for us than moving pallets. So the idea is like, let's get this one up and running and we maybe get 5%. And now uh, all the produce from our fatty mart is going to be coming from the farmer's market. 
Uh, we talk to them and said, like, anything you want to throw away or you can't sell or you don't, you don't want to take home, we'll buy it. And so coupled with that and our staples, you know, people want onions and garlic. And our farms, I want to go from, like, you know, 3 5 10% the first year. And then we open two more and maybe it goes 15 20%. And then we keep doing it until we, you know, get, get as close as to 100 and prove to people. Um, 100 you farms? Can no, 100% from yeah, the farms. Got it. Yeah. So the idea too is like, uh, how do you do that? The warehousing of farms, you're doing vertical stacking. Yeah. So the next, the idea is like, you know, we already designed Juntos, but the next Juntos or Fatty Mart really want to take over like a huge public space that needs to be repurposed like a Sears or whatever. Uh, but we can't buy that, I guess. It's, it's already bought. <laughs> yeah. So like a, a bigger space and do a vertical farm. Uh, um, we have some contacts that, you know, say that they can build in a 40,000 square foot space. Um, you could build 400 acres of vertical farm. Not not the whole thing, but sure. you know, if you have that space, you can grow 400 acres vertically. And now you're in the farming business. Yeah. So you're developing on the vertical. You have to. So you got the construction, you got the tenant. Yeah. Right. So it's the all concept. seamless. Yeah. All right. What else should people to know? Anything else you wanna you wanna bomb? You wanna drop? Yeah. So at the market, we're really I hate the word curating, but you know, we're picking stuff that I would want to eat. You know, it's awesome. We get to tour their, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're going to sell Sior uh, bread. We got to tour their facility. It's really I heard amazing. they have like a thousand versions of flour. Yeah, so he's Owen. really into it. He's like in the International Bread Bakers Guild. There's only like 12 of them. He's a starter from like the 1200s. He has his own herb garden. He mills his own flour. He has a pita making factory that's like uh, not even on yet. So he wants to take over the world of Israeli pita uh, using nice, uh, organic, freshly milled flour. This is the great thing is like, uh, we get to help tell his story about his passion for bread. And uh, he made us a pizza. It was, it was really, really amazing. He made this uh, sweet corn brioche thing that was not even on the menu yet. So he's super talented and he's going to be giving classes and maybe we get some of the experimental stuff. Yeah. So at the market, we're going to feature a lot, of cra- uh, a lot of great producers that we feel like that should be shared with the world. What else? What other? So you got this amazing bread. Yeah. And so, you know, we're doing daring foods. We're doing daring. scout. I, remember uh, I didn't know that we're actually helping the planet by eating canned tin fish, you know? So wait, you're working with scout also? Yeah. All the formal podcast guests? Yeah. yeah. Who's you got? Daring's we're, we're, we're a good one. Scout's this. a good one. Ouroboros is great. The, where's the fake cheese? But we're also supporting a lot of up and coming young people um, trying to, you know, uh, they don't have to start storefronts. They can start selling in our storefront. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of great food, but also a lot of recipes from our own. So like all the Latin food is going to be from my, you know, from our staff. So it's super authentic with a little twist, Korean food with all the panchan, all the stews. I think trying to share that experience of if you went to your Vietnamese friend's house, so you got the whole spread, yeah. not just pho or, you know, banh mi. Okay. Um, trying to share that culture. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. David, what a legend. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Little fatty, fatty Mar, Mar Vista coming soon to Chinatown. Thanks for watching. Check us out in the Fattyverse. It's uh, Little Fatty, LA, and Accomplice Bar, Fatty Mart, uh, Chef David Co., and soon Juntos. That's what's up. Thank you. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over 100 episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.